at me. All right, that's better. Awesome. Well, good morning and welcome. Thank you for those who are joining us as guests. Thank you for those who are watching online. So nice to have you today. For those who don't know me, I am Pastor Brian. Um, happy to be up here with you today. I want to start out with uh, this message this morning, uh, telling a story, because say hey, every good sermon starts with a story. At least that's what we're going to go with today, okay? So this time last Sunday, myself and a few other guys were on our way back from uh, North Georgia. We had just got done doing a, uh, uh, a Bible study or a group study during the summer semester called um, Wild Life by John Eldridge. Some of you might be f familiar with the name. He wrote Wild at Heart. So it was a video study that we were doing, and basically what it was, it was these four guys who took a road trip out to Colorado to spend some time with John Eldridge, to hang out with him, um, to go on a little adventure with him, hiking through the mountains and doing a little fly fishing. And as the guys and I got finished with our study, we decided, you know what, let's do something like this. Let's be adventurous. Let's go do something as a group of men. So we did. So we took a trip up to North Georgia, Tiger, uh, Clay County area there. Uh, and we did a little white water rafting. Might have some pictures there for you. Yeah, a little white water rafting on the Tallulah Gorge. Uh, we followed that up with some rock climbing on a place called Pickens Nose. It was about 5,000 plus feet of elevation. And then uh, uh, the, you'll see a gentleman there with an the orange shirt on. That gentleman's name was Mark Holloway. He was our guide during the rock climbing. He was kind of like our John Eldridge during this trip. Uh, uh, Mark is the type of guy that every man wants to hang out with, a hunter, a fisher, a mountain biker, a rock climber, just a real man's man. At 60, almost 60 years old, he could run us into the dirt. I mean, this guy does Iron Man's everything. This guy was awesome. And he just loves, I've, I've known Mark for a while now, and Mark loves pouring into men. That's what his passion is. He loves pouring into men. He loves sitting down with men and teaching them how to be godly men in this passive world that we live in today. And after we got done climbing the side of this cliff that was like 50 feet tall, Mark sat us down and started talking to us about a reading that he had read uh, just that morning, Luke chapter 15. Now the cool thing about this, this ended up being a, a God incident. Because when Mark sat down to talk to us about Luke 15, he did not know that I would be preaching today. Nor did I know that I was going to be preaching today. So Mark starts to talk to us about Luke 15. And I didn't know that when I got this message from Jeff in the middle of the week, as I began to look through it, I would see that Luke 15 was a supporting scripture to this message. I mean, you can't tell me God's not real. He was working this from the very beginning. Amen. Can we give God some praise or what? God is real. We have an awesome God. So Mark sat down with us and he talked to us about Luke 15. And in Luke 15, you have these three specific stories, these three parables that Jesus shares. Um, basically because he's sitting down, in the, in the beginning of it, he's sitting down with it. And uh, uh, he's challenged by some of the religious leaders. So he shares these three specific messages. And what Mark wanted under, us to understand during this, uh, these mess this, this message that he was sharing with us. In the first one, you have the lost sheep. Right? You have the shepherd with the lost sheep. He has a hundred sheep in his flock. One of them goes missing, but he goes out in search of that one sheep. He's passionate about finding that one. And when he finds that one, he doesn't just usher it back to the flock. He literally picks it up, puts it on his shoulder, and carries it back. And then they have a celebration for this lost sheep. The second parable is about the woman with the ten coins. She loses one. And she's passionate about finding this one coin. She tears her house apart, flipping it upside down, and search for this one coin. And when she finds this one coin, she's, she throws a celebration. She calls all her girlfriends up. They come over and they celebrate her finding this one coin. She was passionate about that one coin. And then the last parable is the prodigal son. The father sees him returning from a distance. And he runs out to meet him. And he runs out to meet him. He hugs him and he kisses him. He's passionate about his son returning home. And what Mark wanted to share with us that day is as men of God, we need to be passionate. We need to be passionate in our relationship with God. We need to be passionate in our relationship with one another. And we need to be passionate when it comes to advancing the kingdom of heaven. And then another time, another evening, we were sitting around and uh, we were in a, uh, a cabin. Uh, the ten of us or the nine of us we were sitting in this cabin. And we dug into Mark chapter 2. Now, if you don't know what that particular story is, that's the story of the four friends who lower their paralyzed friend down to the feet of Jesus through a roof. They get word that Jesus has returned to Capernaum, and they get their friend together, and they're like, hey, we're going to take you to Jesus and get you healed. But when they show up on the scene, the house is so packed, the house is so crowded, that they can't get their friend in. They can't get him through a door or a window. But they refuse to settle for that. They're so passionate about getting their friend healed that they tear, they tear the roof off the house to lower him down at the feet of Jesus. Passion. Passion in that story. And then another night we were talking, 
and we're, uh, Luke was talking to us, not the gospel of Luke, but Luke Dietering was talking to us. He was talking to us about prayer. And he had quoted this quote from, uh, uh, he paraphrased this quote from this book that he was reading. And I want to share with you what Luke said, because I like the way Luke said it better than the actual way that it was said in the book. And I think we have it up there. Yeah, there it is. He said, Luke said, I need to spend time alone first thing in the morning with God to prepare my soul before my soul has the opportunity to affect others. It's powerful stuff. That's passion. That's not just coming to God in prayer for God. This is what I need you to give me. That's coming to God with passion in your heart for what you can do for God. So as we were driving home uh, Sunday from this little adventure that we had, we were in, the guys who were in the car with me, we were talking. I was like, what was the big take home for you? What was the big take home from this weekend that we spent together? And I shared with the guys, for me, it was this idea of passion. This idea of being more passionate in my relationship with God. This idea of being more passionate in my prayer life with God. Having a more intimate relationship with God. Because Mark had said something else that day. He said, imagine if your relationship with your wife was like your relationship with God. You wake up in the morning. Hey, Jeanette, I got a busy day today. Could really use some strength. How about giving me a little strength? Amen. Love you. See you tomorrow. Hey, God. Or, hey, Jeanette, having a little anxiety today. How about giving me a little confidence and a little strength in my heart today? Amen. Thank you. Love you. See you tomorrow. Wouldn't be much of a relationship, right? Because there's no intimacy there. There's no passion. There's no time spent together. So when I came home, I told Jeanette, I'm like, you know, I was all fired up. I'm like, I got this new passion in my heart to be more intimate with God for a more intimate, passionate prayer life with God. So I go to bed that night. I set my alarm clock to get up early, you know, 30, 45 minutes early. I know some of you guys are probably thinking, what, 30, 45 minutes? That's all you got? You're talking about being passionate? I get like three hours. I'm still growing in my Christianity. All right, keep praying for me, okay? But I set my alarm. I'm going to get up early, get the coffee pot going. And I walk over to my daughter's room because the kitchen light shines right into her room. And being the good dad that I am, I don't want to wake her up. So I go over there to shut her door, but I see her laying there in bed. And I'm looking at her. I'm like, man, I haven't seen her in like three days and three nights. I kind of miss her. I just want to cuddle with her for a little while. So I crawl in bed and I cuddle with her for a little while. That little while, of course, turns into a long while. And instead of starting my day out with the peace and presence of God, we ended up starting our day out with the chaos of Satan and all his dominions as we were running around the house trying to get everybody frantically ready for school and work. So that day was an epic failure for me. But that's okay because Tuesday was a new day. Tuesday was going to be my day. So again, set my alarm. I get up early, and we had success. Spent my time on my hands and knees before God, just praying to God to be more passionate in my relationship with him, praying to God that I, would, that I could be his hands and feet as I passionately went out about my day. So they started out great. So they, they started out good. Dropped the kids off of school, driving to work. About an hour and a half later, I get a text from Pastor Jeff. Hey, you got a second to talk? Sure. So I call him up. And you know how people will normally on Facebook, they'll, they'll post conversation dialogues that they have with somebody a lot of times as a parent and child. It's cute and it's funny and stuff like that. So what I want to do this morning is I want to post the conversation that Jeff and I had so you guys can get a good picture of how it went down, okay? So it started out, I called up Pastor Jeff. Pastor Jeff answered the phone. He said, hey, Brian, need you to step up and preach this weekend. Some things have happened and uh, uh, some things have come up and Mike and I are unavailable. Me? No, absolutely not. I mean, literally, it, at minimum, two weeks to prepare for you guys. I mean, come on, this isn't going down this way. So, no, can't do it. Jeff, really need you. No, not doing it. Jeff, topic, strong-willed child. Nope, not doing it. Figured, Jeff, figured you, you'd be perfect having been a strong-willed child. Mm -mm. No. <laughs> Jeff, since you have a couple of strong-willed children, figured you could relate. Others could relate to you. Nope, not doing it. But then something amazing happened. It was as if Jeff's voice turned into God's voice, sounding a whole lot like Morgan Freeman, if you can imagine. <laughs> and this is what I heard Jeff saying to me. Brian, you said you wanted to be more passionate in your relationship with me. So now my confidence turn no has turned into a no. God, you were going to be talking about Luke 15, which I have already spoken to you through Mark this weekend while you were basking in my presence on the side of that mountain that I created for you thousand years ago. Remember that place where your heart was passionately moved and you said to me in a quiet secret, God, I'm all yours to use. And at this time it was, ah, no. 
God, when I said all those things, did you really think it was necessary to move in such a God-like speed fashion? God, yes, me. All right, fine, I'll do it. So long story short, many of you are expecting Pastor Mike. No, Pastor Mike, you got me. So I will take all the sympathy praises you want to give me this morning. All right. Well, let's open up in prayer before we uh, begin into this message, ask for God's presence. God, we just thank you so much for this morning. God, we thank you uh, for the worship team who has passionately led us into your presence. God, as we dig into your word, that is my prayer right now, God, that your words will be etched on our heart, passionately moving us closer to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So today I get to bring you our last message in our Family Matters series, which is titled Parenting Matters When Dealing with a Strong-Willed Child. Pretty long title, but that's going to be the title this morning. How many of you in here have had or have a strong-willed child in your life? All right, excellent. So there's a lot of common ground in here. Let's start out with defining what a strong-willed child is. A strong-willed child is one who loves to challenge the rules. This is a child who knows that anything is possible. They know that their way might not be your way, but in their mind, it does not mean it's the wrong way. In your mind, it might take longer and be inconvenient to do it, but it can still be done. So when it comes to this term, strong-willed child, we often receive this term in a negative way, but it's not always negative, right? Being strong-willed can actually be a good trait. It can be a great leadership trait, being strong-willed. Strong-willed person is someone who's not going to give in to everybody else. They're not going to be a follower, but they're going to be a leader. Another thing about a strong-willed person is sometimes it's not so much that they're strong-willed, but they're able to think outside of the box, the problem with, is, though, as parents, when it comes to dealing with a strong-willed child, this can be frustrating and often create, create anxiety, right? You know, begin, you begin to walk around the house on eggshells wondering what it is that's going to set this child off. Or you begin to be concerned, how are people going to view me when my child starts to act this way? And there's the other side of it, you know, right now, my, you know, my child's 11 years old, right? I can control him. But what about when he's a teenager? The threat of taking his Legos away for the rest of his life is not going to be so impactful, is it? But these are real-world scenarios when it comes to dealing with a strong-willed child. The other thing about a strong-willed child is they don't all come in the same shape or size, do they? Right? For us, our, our son, Frankie, he's that more stubborn, strong, strong-willed child. Right? You're sitting at the dinner table. Frankie, you are going to eat that broccoli or you are not leaving this table. Okay. I will sit right here and camp out all night. I am fine with not eating this broccoli. I'll see you in the morning, Pops. I don't care how much you try to pay him. And yes, I have tried. Don't judge me. It's frustrating, okay? And then there's Gracie. She's the other type of strong will. Mrs. Independent, I can do it myself. I don't care if you have 32 years of life experience on me. I can do this. Strong will children of two different types. But the thing is, we're all strong will. Each and every one of us are strong will in some way or form because it's the way that we were created. In God's infinite wisdom, he created us each with free will. And because of that, we can all be strong will. Well, there's one thing, you know, that I've learned when it comes to being a father. There are a few things that I've learned, but one of them is, in order to have success when dealing with my children is, uh, who are strong-willed, I have to know their strengths and their weaknesses. I have to know their strengths and their weaknesses. I have to know what it is that makes them click. I have to know how to be able to connect with this. I have to know how to be able to win their hearts because they're not always going to think rationally when I have to put rules out, but I have to discipline my children, right? The other thing that I've learned is people have often said that I wish they would create a manual on how to raise kids. The thing is, they have. It's called the Word of God. This entire book is a manual on the relationship between a father and his children. You want to know how to be a parent, how to parent a strong-willed child? It's all in this book. So I'm not going to stand up here and pretend like I am a, a, a parenting expert, that I am a psychologist by any means. And I mean, be honest, I'm sure some of you have children in here who are older than me. But these are the few of the things that I have learned in my 11 years of parenting. And to help us have a better understanding of how we can parent well with strong-willed children, we're going to be digging into Luke chapter 15 this morning, uh, verses 11 through 32. If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand up. Somebody will bring a Bible down to you. That's our gift to you. You can keep that. You can write in it. You can take notes in it. If not, it will be on the overhead above us. You can follow along up there as well. So prior to getting into this portion of Scripture, just let me give you a little context, context Excuse me, leading up to it. 
So this chapter begins, we're going to jump into the third parable, but this chapter begins because Jesus is sitting down and he's hanging out with some tax collectors and sinners. Now the Pharisees and the, teacher of the law, teachers of the laws are, are around the area and they notice this and they begin to mutter under the, their breath, who is this guy that hangs out with these people? Because to hang out with these people was to classify yourself as one of them. And during this time, the tax collectors were the worst of the worst. This were the people who stole from their own people. So they were viewed as the worst. So Jesus understands what's going on. He's here, he hears what's going on, so he tells these three parables. And what these three parables actually are, they are a contrast of God's love and the exclusiveness of the Pharisees. Because they would exclude themselves beyond everybody else because they felt they were holier than them. So we're going to jump into verse 11 this morning. Mark, or Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And that's where we're at. We're in the third parable. So it starts out with saying, uh, Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. So from the very beginning of the story, we see this strong-willed demeanor of this young son. We see a rebellious, adventurous, lack of the better welfare of his father type strong will in him. When he's speaking to his father, he says this word give. Now this verb give that he's using in the original Greek context was a very disrespectful way to speak to your father. And basically what he's doing, he's demanding for his father to give, his, give him his inheritance now, even though this was something that was done after the family member had passed away. So we jump into verse 13 and it says, Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. So obviously the father has given the, young, the younger son his wishes despite the insanity of it. And this is hard for us. This is hard for us as parents, right? It's hard for us to allow our children to fail even though we know it's not the right choice that they're going to make. But you know what? It's in those failures that we often learn the greatest lessons. It's in those decisions that hurt the most that we grab a hold of the greatest. And sometimes as parents, though we want to protect our children, sometimes we have to let them fail. And honestly, sometimes we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice because the majority of the time when we make a de decision, we make a decision based on our emotions. It doesn't matter how wise the wisdom is or who it's coming from, we're still going to make that choice. Your parent can know better than you and say, you know what, that boy, that girl is no good for you because they can see from the outside in and they have years of experience, but because you're being led by your emotions, you're still going to make these choices. And sometimes this is hard to let our children fail, but this is exactly what we're going to see the father doing here. In verse 14, it said, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So here's where we begin to relate to this younger, strong-willed child. Because the truth is, we're all strong-willed in some way or form. We all want God to give us our blessings, but we don't always want to follow the rules. And we do, when we do it our way, when we do it this way, we end up starving our souls of what it truly needs. We end up looking for satisfactions of the things of this world, which we end up finding out they're only temporary satisfactions, only leaving us wanting more and more and more. But the thing is, we're always going to want more. We're always going to want more money. We're always going to want more fame. We're always going to want more accolades, more acknowledgement. And because of this, we end up feeding the desires of our flesh and, and, and starving the desires of our spirit, leaving our souls longing and wanting more. And oftentimes, we end up doing what we see this young man do. We end up looking in all the wrong places, which leads us to the lowest of lows. When we get to verse 15, it says, So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country. So he, now he has sold himself out to somebody else who sent him to, his, to the fields to feed pigs. So someone who was once a servant now becomes a servant, a servant to pigs. And this is right where the enemy wants you and me to be today, to feel like we have to be lowered, that we have to lower ourselves because of our past actions and the choices that we have made. To allow the sins of our past to put us in this position of, of shame, almost this position of spiritual paralysis. And for this Jewish boy, to be in the position of feeding pigs was to be in the lowest he could be at. For him, this was to mean that he was unclean and unworthy. This is exactly where the enemy wants you to be today. He wants you to be in a position where you feel 
unclean and unworthy by your past actions, by your past choices. He wants to hold you on a mat of spiritual paralysis so that you cannot be affected for the kingdom of heaven. But that is a lie. That is a lie because God looks at you and he doesn't see you as unclean. He doesn't see you as unworthy. He sees you as perfect. He sees you as washed clean by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, who he sent for you. And God is looking down on you this morning. If you're struggling with this in your own life, feeling like you're not worthy to be before a holy and clean God, God is looking down at you this morning. And he is telling you, like that paralyzed man that was lowered down from that roof, to get up off your mat, to pick up that mat. That mat, that symbol of your past choice, can be God's glory in this world if you pick it up and use it. The enemy wants you to think that he will fill your head full of lies. He wants you to think that you are unworthy, that you're ugly because of the choices that you made, that you're an addict because of the choices that you made, that you're a divorcee because of the choices that you made, that you're stupid because of the choices that you made. And God says, no, no, you are none of those things. You are highly intelligent because you are made in my likeness. You are beautiful because you are made in my image. And God is telling you this morning, get up off your mat to pick up your mat and use that mat as his symbol, forcefully advancing his kingdom of heaven and giving him all the glory through your past mistakes. You are not unclean. You are not unworthy. You are perfect and created for greatness by a great and holy God. And that is what he wants you to understand. That is the senses that he wants you to come to this morning. That is the senses he wants you to come to this morning. That is the senses that we begin to see the son come to this morning. In verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your higher servants. So he got up and he went to his father. See? He had to fail. He had to fail. The father had to allow his strong-willed son to fall flat on his face in order for his heart to be truly right. As parents, this is hard. As parents, this is hard, but this is the truth. I had to hurt. I had to be broken. I had to know what it was like to be without before I could understand what it was like to be with through the grace and love of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying that God will purposely punish you. That is not what I'm saying here. What I am saying is God's not going to remove you from what he can grow you through. He's not going to take you away from what he can use you through. 90% of the time, if we were to stop in our current situation and circumstance that we're in, if we were to stop and turn around and look at how we got to where we got today, we would understand and see that we got there because of our own strong will, our own choices. And God's not going to necessarily remove you from that when he can grow you through it. That right there is reason to give God praise this morning. I am not defined by my past, by my mistakes. But that mat is a mighty symbol that I get to use for God's glory. Because of his love and grace for me as an overcomer. Amen? Continue on the next verse, verse 20 says, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. The son doesn't even feel that he's worthy to be viewed by his father. But as soon as the father sees him, He puts him in a position of authority. To put a robe on him, to put a signet ring on his finger, to put sandal on his feet, was to put him in a position of authority. And then he says, bring a fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And I want you to hold on to that portion of the scripture because we're going to come back to it. We're going to continue ahead with uh, verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son, so now we're going to take a look at the other strong-willed child, was in the field. He came near the house and heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed a fattened calf because he he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. How dare him? How dare him come back in this way? I'm not celebrating him. 
He was the one who made the stupid choice to go in the first place. I'm not celebrating him. He's frustrated. How many of you know frustration is the fuel for a strong-willed child? Continues on to say that, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Sounds good. Sounds like the perfect son, right? But check out his heart. He says, you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But daddy, Frankie got this. Frankie got that. But God, everybody's getting theirs. Where's our heart in that? It continues on in verse 30 to say, but when the son of yours, you can't even call him who he is, right? You can't even call him his brother. The son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill a fattened calf for him. Now, nowhere in, I found this funny because nowhere in the scriptures does it say that he, the youngest son was out chasing prostitutes, but this is right where the oldest son goes, right? This is exactly where he goes and just throws it out there. But look at how the father reacts. In verse 31, he says, my son, you are always with me. And everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. For the first son, it says that the father saw him from a distance and went running out to him. This, is, this means that the father had been on the outlook for his son. There was a hope of a return. And when he sees him in the distance, there's no discontent in his heart. When he sees him in the distance, he goes running to him. And when he gets there, there's no scolding. There's no, you know, I told you so. There's no, you got what you deserve. What does he get? He gets love. The father runs to him. He embraces him. He places him in his arms. He hugs and he kisses him. A love full of grace and mercy. Notice that the father's actions came long before the son could even say a word. The father moved. Sound familiar? It should. It should. For the second son, again, we see the father move. He goes to him despite his hardened heart, despite his pride. And the father reminds him, I've always been here with you. I've always been here with you, and everything that I have is yours. So often, we get fixed on what we don't have. The grass is greener on the other side, and God is saying to us, I'm always with you, and everything that I have is yours. I've given you the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. How much more could you want? How much more is better than that? When it comes to children, as parents, like the father in this parable who represents God, it is our responsibility to move into the lives of our children. And we move by being consistent. We move by being consistent in our actions. Proverbs 22, 16 says, start, off, or start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are older, they will not turn from it. So this brings us to our first step of parenting a strong-willed child, consistency. This whole series, the theme verse has been Deuteronomy 6, where God gives his children of Israel a command to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And in doing so, we are to walk with our children and teach them this in everything that we do. As we're walking down the street, as we're driving down the road, as we're making their breakfast, as we're wiping their nose, we are to be consistent in this. We're to be passionate about our relationship with God, loving him with all our hearts, with all our soul, and all our strength. And the only way that we can do that is through passionately seeking time, intimate relationship time with him through the position of prayer. We have to be passionate about that, and then we have to set that example for our children. And it's through this passion that they begin to learn how to love God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their strength. We have to be passionate about our relationship with God. That's the first step. The second step is focusing on the positive. When it comes to strong-willed children, we can't focus on the negative. We have to be reminded, we have to keep ourselves reminded that this is a gift from God. This is a gift from God with great potential. We do that by directing the child's strong will towards positive purposes instead of negative ones. The other thing we do is we hunt the good stuff in our children. right? You hunt the good stuff in your children, and then you gloat over that with them. Three weeks into school, man, my boy's got all A's. Don't think I ain't riding that horse like crazy right now. Look at this. 
This is you. You're a straight A student. We do that because we want to speak life into them. We talked about this last time uh, when we were up here during our, during our, uh, our uh, marriage seminar, right? You kept hearing this reoccurring theme. Speak life into your spouse because they begin to believe it. Speak life into your children because they begin to believe it as well. The next step is discipline wisely. Discipline wisely. Don't discipline with anger. Take that second second to step back. Bring it before God in prayer. Asking God to give you grace and mercy in handling the situation. Well, along with that, we pick our battles. We pick the ground that we're going to die on, the hill that we're going to die on, right? You come up with what are your core values? What are those core values in your family that you are not going to bend on? And that is the battle that you pick. The, that, that's the hill that you pick to die on. But sometimes there's the things that, you know what, maybe we don't need to die on that hill. Pick your battles, but don't give ground to your core values. The other thing is give clear instructions, right? We'll give clear discipline. Frankie, you do that again. I'm going to take my Nintendo Switch away from you for the rest of your life. You'll never hear the sweet music of Mario Odyssey again, I promise you. We'll give clear consequences, but we don't always give clear instructions. We have to remember a child is a child. They think like a child. They act like a child. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away, or I put the ways of childhood behind me. We cannot fall back on childish ways when it comes to disciplining our children. We have to learn to control our emotions. When we lose our cool, when we lose our emotions, we then give that over to our children. And we set a poor example. So the next step with that is don't make empty threats that you cannot keep. When we make empty threats that we, do not, that we do not keep, we begin to allow our children to see that there's really no consequences to their actions. And instead of correcting a pattern of bad behavior, we begin to con condone a pattern of bad behavior. The next one is safeguard your children. As parents, it's our responsibility to safeguard our children. The Word of God says that we are to save up for our children. We are to plan. We are to safeguard for our children. We are to set our children up for success. If you have a child who doesn't like school or doesn't do good at school, it's on you as the parent to battle plan for that child, to help them have success for that, to find where their strengths or weaknesses and help them click, help them to get in the right mode with that. And the other thing is we need to surround our kids with adults who will encourage them. As a parent, it's your responsibility to safeguard the environment of your children, to put up those guardrails. If you have people coming in your home who are negative, that's going to negatively influence your family. It's your responsibility as the mom. It's your responsibility as a dad to put safeguards up in your children's life. When something happens, the other one is when something happens, don't necessarily just take it as it is. Don't just necessarily believe that your child uh, is at fault when they get in trouble. I don't have time to get into the story, but last year Frankie had uh, uh, gotten some trouble at school, and the principal called us up. Uh, and, you know, take it from here what the principal said, Frankie was in the wrong, but when we started talking to Frankie and we started digging deeper into it, you know what we found out? Frankie wasn't in the wrong. Frankie was right. And we stood our ground. And that's something that Frankie's going to remember for the rest of his life. That his father stood alongside him. That his father stood alongside him and defended him. So don't just necessarily assume that your child is in the wrong. Get deeper into it. And the other thing is take time to listen to your child. Be open-minded. Sometimes that strong-willed child, she's right, and her way is better than mine. We have to be able to be humble in that. And finally, the last thing is envision your desired destination of your child and pray for them and pray with them. You want to learn how to be a good parent to a strong-willed child? It begins and ends with a passionate position of prayer on our hands and knees before God. Seeking a deeper, more intimate, more passionate relationship with him. As parents, we are to model that for our children. We are to teach them up in that way. We are to bring them into that. You want to learn how to be a good parent? Be an obedient child to your heavenly father. Here's the thing. He's already moved towards you. He's already moved towards you and I in this. Now it's our responsibility to move into the lives of of our children this morning. The band's going to come back out here. They're going to close with that reckless love song. 
And as you listen to this song, I don't care if you don't sing it, what I want to challenge you with this morning is I want you to meditate on the words of this song. Because this song this morning is this message that God has for us. We have a God who has moved into a reckless love. Not a love that's chaotic and out of control, but a love that was planned. A love that was set in motion long before you and I ever existed in this world. A perfect love. A love that will shine a light on any shadow. A love that will climb any mountain to get closer to you this morning. We have a God who will kick down any wall to get closer to you. We have a God who will tear through, tear through any lie through the blood of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you and me this morning. So as you listen to the words of this song, realize that God has already moved in your life. You have the perfect father and you are the perfect child. Do not allow the lies of the enemy of this world to hold you in a place where you feel like you're in spiritual paralysis, that you, you have a deformity because of past, past choices. You have no deformities. You are perfect. You are holy and you are wonderfully made by a great God. He has a great plan for you this morning, Life Coast Church. So this morning as you listen to these words, let it move your heart. Let it move you passionately. And if God is moving in you this morning, if he has moved through you th through this message, through the words of the song, don't just sit there this morning. Come down here this morning. We'll have the prayer team down here in the front. I'll be down here in the front. You got James down here in the front. Ryan will be down here. We want to walk with you into the presence of God this morning. Get up on your feet this morning, Life Coast. Let's get up on our feet. And as we listen to these words, allow God's love, allow his passion to move passionately in you for a deeper, more intimate relationship with your creator, with your, with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God, let us pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. Yes, give him praise. Give him praise this morning. That's fine. We will pray with the praises. We can, nowhere in the word of God to say we can't pray and praise at the same time. Praise if you want to. God, we love you. God, we thank you that you have moved into our lives, God. That the lives of this enemy does not hold us in bondage. It does not hold us on a matter of deformity. We are not in spiritual paralysis because you are greater. You are greater and you have moved into our lives, God. You love us. Father, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your son who you sent to die on our cross, God. Just move to into our hearts this morning, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.